بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمت الله و برکاته Dear respected brothers, sisters and viewers Welcome to another episode of Live in London with our esteemed guest Dr. Sayed Amman Akshwani Now throughout this year we have celebrated and looked at various Eids such as Eid al-Fetr a few months ago Eid al-Qadir on Friday night's show if any of the viewers tuned in and inshallah in this week we'll be looking at Eid al-Mubahila and celebrating it worldwide whether it's with our families or friends or our local centers. Now the event of Mubahila is one commonly known as the interaction or debate that took place between the Holy Prophet and his Holy Family, peace and blessings be upon them all, and the Christians of Najran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sayyidina. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. honor to have you on our Thank you. Show Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Given that this Eid is an interaction between the Muslims and Christians, are there any other examples from the Holy Quran that this sort of event has taken place before? There are bound to be examples in the Holy Quran of Christian Muslim interaction simply because of the fact that you've got, you know, two religions which share a common message, share common values, share are really in and around a few hundred years of one another. Their births are seen as being within five to six hundred years of one another. And there's bound to therefore be a number of references in the Holy Quran to the Christians or to those who had helped the message of Christ as an example for the nascent Muslim community, let's say in Mecca or in Medina at the time. If you're looking within the Holy Quran, I think it's vital that Muslims are aware of the interactions between uh, the Christian community and the early Muslim community, as well as the interactions that can be seen within the Holy Quran, where you find the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, in a way using examples from the lives either of Christ or the life of Mary alayhi salam, or using the examples of a group of believers who also found it very difficult in the early days to hold on to the message of God. Um, you notice that in early Islam, you've got this uh, situation where the companions are finding great difficulty uh, with the oppression of the Me Meccan aristocrats. And so what we see is that there's a reference back to the companions or the disciples of Christ, for example, who were also finding difficulties in their time. So if you look at, let's say, um, the story of Ashab al-Kahf, you've got the seven sleepers of Ephesus, as it's known in Christian literature, uh, a group of youths who are believers in the oneness of God, believers in Christ, and the message of the prophets that have preceded Christ. And, and you've got their story being mentioned. They're oppressed, they need to leave, but because they have faith, uh, the Quran mentions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided them. So that's, you know, a very beautiful story of a group of Christ's lovers, a group of Christ's believers um, who the Quran wants to uh, praise. Then you have, for example, the disciples of Christ when they go to the land of Antioch in Surah Yasin with the famous verses, You've got two of the disciples being sent to that land, the people belied them, a third disciple is sent. So again, you've got a reference back to the disciples of Christ. Then you have, for example, general verses about Christianity. Um, and these general verses, for example, could be found uh, in, let's say, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, for example, verse 82, when the Quran says, uh, You'll see the closest people to you in reciprocal love are the Christians because they have priests and they have monks who are humble human beings. And then you have a reference to the persecution that the Christian community faces. As can be seen, for example, in Surah Al-Buruj, Ashab al are a group of people who had to face the ditches and be burnt in what was a holocaust. The Jewish community had burnt the Christian community under the leadership of Yusuf bin Dinu As al-Himyari. They had burnt the Christian community. You know, holos kostos is the origin of the word holocaust and it means complete burning. And they had completely burnt these people. They burnt their children, they burnt their wives, 
And these people, one of the safe havens they found later on would be the land of Najran. Yeah? So, you know, in that, in that border of Yemen and modern day Saudi Arabia, these people would find a safe haven holding on to Christianity. You've got the general terminology, Ahl al Kitab, which is mentioned in the Quran. And it's notice, uh, one notices Ahl al Kitab, the people of the book. One would think it should be, for example, why is it not Ahl al Kutub? Why is it Ahl al Kitab? So when the Quran says, Qul ya Ahl al Kitab, ta'ala, why isn't the Quran not saying, Qul ya Ahl al Kutub? Because we have the Torah and the Injil and the Quran, the, the Torah and the Bible and the Quran should be the people of the books. But it's as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that your message is all one message from the heavens. It's the same message and it's a submission to the Lord. So you've got all of these wonderful examples and Mubahala is another one, another of the examples of that Christian-Muslim interaction that takes place and the theological discussions that occur within. The year when I was researching this topic in the morning, uh, the year that Mubahala actually took place is referred to as Am al Wafud. You have to yes, excuse Am my Arabic. Yep, yep, yep. Why, is, uh, why does that have a name for the year? Why isn't it just a, a number like 10th after Hijra, for example? Well, yeah, it's, it's 9th after Hijra, the year when it took place, but Arabs hit, uh, hither to that point were, were naming their years after the most notable event um, that's taken place. So, for example, if I were to ask you, what was, um, you know, what was that notable event named after an animal in the Quran, where you had an army that came to attack Surah Mecca, Fee. that was Surah Al Fil. So the Am would be called Am Al Fil, the year of the elephant. You're not exactly going to be at that time saying 570 and 620 and 621 and 61 and so on. Of course, later on. You know, with, with the beginning of the Muslim calendar, then you've got this dating that, you know, begins after Hijra. Whereas up to that point, you've got the years. And what's happening is that the, the year is named after the most notable events. So, for example, if, if Abraha and his army have attacked Mecca at that point, it's called the year of the elephant. And that year was called the year of the delegations. The year when Mubahala took place was known as the year of the delegations. The reason it was known as the year of the delegations was because there were now many delegations that finally wanted to come and visit and meet the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family from all different backgrounds, rich, poor, educated, non-educated, Arab, non-Arab, Muslim, non-Muslim, to finally get a glimpse of what exactly his ideas are after years of uh, propaganda against him. Yeah. So if, if they came to visit him, I'm assuming Mecca and Medina, did they become like a central hub for Islam back then? Is that why they would come to these cities? Well, what the context of what's taking place at this time is that he is he's now virtually got control of Mecca and Medina. It was only a few years earlier to enter Mecca for a few days was a, was a, difficult, um, was a difficult idea for many of the Muslims, as in the Hudaybiyah Treaty had sought to somehow uh, build relations between the Muslim community in Medina and the Quraysh elite until the opening of Mecca took place a couple of years later. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family was already powerful in Medina. But now he has Mecca and Medina under his belt. And when he has Mecca and Medina under his belt, what we find is that there are lots of tribes and lots of people who for years have had misconceptions about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. You may have people who even are viewing the show who may not necessarily be Muslim, but I've heard, you know, propaganda against the Holy Prophet trying to vilify his image. And sometimes what you want to do is you want to actually go and meet people who know about the man. In those days, you could actually go and you could actually go and meet the man himself. You can go to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. And maybe you've heard Islam is a religion of X, Y, Z. Well, go to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family and ask him. So what you had is that Delegation after delegation now wanted to go and meet him. And if you look at the way some of these Arabs were, you know, were coming to meet him and to talk to him, it was, it was extremely interesting. You've got, you've got, for example, someone who came to meet the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. He said to him, uh, you're Muhammad. He said, yes. He said, what do you think about sheep? He said to him, yeah, the creation of God. And, you know, what do you think about camels? And he's like, well, they're a creation of God. And then he asked the Prophet Muhammad. He says to him, okay, what if someone steals my sheep? And... Prophet Muhammad said, well, you know, justice is to be observed. And he's like, mm, you know what, it sounds like a cool religion to me. I'll join it. There were people who, who were that 
you know, basic. Mm. They just wanted to see, well, do his ethical principles? Um, <clears throat> do they uh, accord with my ethical principles? Then there were others, for example, who wanted to join Islam, wanted to become Muslims, but not wholeheartedly. And they still wanted to live a certain life. For example, there were those who came to visit him who said, um, we'll be Muslim. We'll pray, we'll fast, but we've still got one idol at that tree over there. Do you mind if we just visit like once a week? There were others who, for example, would say we pray, we fast, but do you mind if we have the odd drink once a month? And Islam, one of its meanings is submitting wholeheartedly to God and not picking and choosing which parts of the religion you want to submit to. I remember Jabir bin Abdullah al-Ansari has a discussion with Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Jabir sees this dream where there's a piece of cloth hanging from the sky. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he tells Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi salam, people were taking parts of the cloth and leaving others. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam says to him, this is one of the signs of the reappearance of the Imam. That Muslims will take part of the religion that suits them. And the parts that don't suit them, they'll leave. Today, this is similar to what was happening in Am al Wafud in the year of the delegations when the Mubahala took place, ninth year after Hijrah. That the Muslims, those who wanted to become Muslims, were now saying, well, there's parts of Islam that we'll observe, and other parts which, if we're not ready for, you're not going to make us observe. Now, someone sometimes throws the argument by saying, but the Quran says there's no compulsion religion, so you can't force me to observe something I'm not ready for. Yes, I've heard people say this. That you can't force me to observe something I'm not ready, ready for. <clears throat> There's no compulsion in religion when it comes to the principles of the religion. I can't force you to believe in Tawheed. I can't force you to believe in Nubuwa. I can't force you to believe in, for example, one of the usul of the madhab of Al-Muhammad, Imam. I can't force you to believe in it. I can certainly give you the guidelines. I can't. However, the moment you submit to those principles, the moment you accept them, you have to submit to the laws of the religion. A person cannot turn around and say, I'm not ready to do so and so. You know, we have people in our community who will say, for example, about certain acts of worship, they'll say blatantly that I'm not ready to do this act. And you'll say, but hold on, you're disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the process. They're like, well, you know, when I'm ready, when I feel it, then I'll do it. Or once I get married is an example. Or once I get married, for example, and so on. So what was happening is that you've got these. You've also got then... For example, Ali al-Akbar, Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam, son of Imam al-Hussein, his great-grandfather from his mother Layla's side was Urwa bin Mas'ud al-Thaqafi. And Urwa bin Mas'ud al-Thaqafi had come, and when he had come, he had come to visit the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, on behalf of the people of Thaqif. Thaqif and Hawazin are two brutal Arab tribes you don't want to face. And they were the most vicious of opponents to Ali ibn Abi Talib on the day of Hunayn. But Ali ibn Abi Talib is the master of all warriors and annihilates them. But what you have is that he's the head of the people of Thaqif. And he now comes to meet the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And he's enamored by the Holy Prophet. And who would have thought at that meeting that one day that man's great granddaughter is going to marry that man's grandson, grandson yeah. because Imam al-Hussein later marries Layla who's the daughter of Maymuna, daughter of Abi Murra, uh, you know Layla the daughter of Maymuna uh, and she is the granddaughter of Urwa bin Mas'ud al-Thaqafi and so what you have there is he tells Banu Thaqif, he goes back to them now you've made rumors about this man for ages you've hated him for ages, I've gone to meet him and the man's the best of men. And a, a man who's brought a religion, which the principles of which are going to guide us. And sadly, his, com his f community ended up killing him. And that's why Urwa bin Mas'ud al-Thaqafi is compared to the Mu'min of Ali Asin, who came from the furthest parts of the city to guide his own people. So you've got all of these delegations that are coming, one after the other. They're all wanting to meet the Holy Prophet Muhammad. And now naturally, one of the most important delegations that's going to come 
is the delegation of other religions. These people, let's say Arab, Bedouin, or some cases polytheist, whatever. How about the other religions? What do they do? And now you find that members of the other religions are slowly going to come towards Medina to try and find out who is this man who claims that he's the messenger of God. So regarding the, as an example, the Christians of Najran, mm. you mentioned they went through a holocaust, they took refuge in Najran. What made them come to meet the Holy Prophet? Did, did they not have churches where they were or does, did Islam not allow them to have churches? Well, when they came to meet the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, they had one phenomenal church in Najran and it was called Ka'bat Najran. In the same way the Ka'ba, you know, in Mecca is a central place of worship. They have got this phenomenal church known as the Ka'ba of Najran. And they're worshipping in that church. You know, you've got 73 different, you know, type of tribes who are living in that area. 40,000 visitors towards that church. People coming from far and wide. So they, they were practicing Christianity. Practicing Christianity comfortably. But now they know there's a man who heads the state. A man who Medina's his, Mecca's his. And they feel that they have to go and discuss with him. Does this man know anything about Moses? Does he know anything about Christ? Does he know anything about Jacob or Joseph? You know, many times as Muslims, when we talk about the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, one of the biggest mistakes we make is separating the discussion about him from the other prophets who preceded him. What then happens is we make the Prophet Muhammad sound like an Arab random guy who emerges without letting the world know this is one of the great grandchildren of Ishmael. This isn't a random who's just popped out of nowhere. This is a person who's raised the nobility in the sense of he comes from ancestors who are the most renowned and the most noble. So the Christian community hither to that point, they've got their church. And the Prophet Muhammad is also, when he first enters Medina, one of the main reasons why he is ordered to defend the land of Medina from the attack of Abu Sufyan and the henchmen of the Meccan aristocrats, the Quran mentions in tw chapter 22, verse 39 to 41, If it wasn't for us telling the Prophet Muhammad, if it wasn't for us telling the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to defend himself, there wouldn't be a single church or monastery or synagogue or mosque. It's a shame if there's a Muslim country where there's no churches. In the absence of an, of an infallible, let's say, in Shia theology, it's a shame if there is a country that claims to be a Muslim majority country that does not allow the Christian community to worship. So, some of these Christians never met the Prophet Muhammad in their life, had been happily living where they were living, but now decided that, you know what, let's take, for example, a group of us, and let's go and see this man. Committee. Let's go and ask him some questions. Let's see the way he interacts with us. And if he claims to be a man of God, we'll take this even further. We're not just going to stop there. We'll take this even further and even possibly be willing to invoke God's curse upon whoever of us is lying. Uh, I read in a narration around 40,000 of them turned up. Is that, I mean, that's, that's you know, if you, if you were to gather 10,000 people, would that not be an, an act of war? I mean, how did, just to get my head round invoking curses and challenging people to debates, how did that whole encounter occur in Medina? What, what? push these events to take place? I wouldn't say 40,000 definitely turn up. I'd say that there's certainly, you know, a good number of their high priests who turn up. And when they turn up, they come in quite, you know, quite luxurious regalia, you know, and, uh, and they want to, you know, they enter, according to different narrations, the mosque of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. And one narration mentions that they meet Abd al-Rahman bin Awf and they meet Uthman bin Affan. And they ask, where is Muhammad? And the reply from the two of them is, Ali is sitting there, go ask him. When they go to ask Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib 
<clears throat> he looks at them and he says, come back tomorrow in garments a bit more humble. And you will definitely meet the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. And they realize that as men of God, that entering the mosque in such a situation representing the religion with a man who has, you know, himself said that he's the messenger of God and the final one, maybe required a bit more humility from them and they come back the next day. And when they come back the next day, as we mentioned, they want to see, this, you know, there's a lot of false prophets out there. There's a lot of false prophets, lots of false messiahs. And let's see if this man actually is a man of God. So first, amongst the questions they ask him is who was Joseph's father? Nabi Yusuf alayhi salam. They ask him, who was his father? And the reply is, Jacob. Yaqub. They say to him, who was Moses' father? He says, Imran. Who's your father? Says, Abdullah. And they said to him, who was Jesus' father? That's the point they want to reach. Who's Jesus' father? The Quran the verses revealed upon the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family at that moment. Because when the Prophet Muhammad replies, Jesus had no father. They said, then God must be his father. He is the son of God. And the Quran then replies to them with the phenomenal principle. إِنَّ مَثَلَ عِيسَى عِنْدَ اللَّهِ كَمَثَلِ آدَمْ خَلَقَهُ مِنْ تُرَابٍ ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُنْ the example of Jesus is similar to that of Adam. God created him from dust and said, be and it will be. Kun fayakun, created him from clay and be and it will be. If you're saying Jesus should be the son of God because Jesus did not have a father, Adam has a greater right of being the son of God because Adam has no father or no mother. So therefore, they, they begin to see that, you know what, there is a point being made here. That this man knows Moses, knows Joseph. He knows, for example, about the Abrahamic prophets. But he's given us something to think about when it comes to Christ. Many Christians will say this same line. That Jesus must be the son of God because Jesus did not have a father. A father. I often wonder in my research a couple of things. Number one is... Adam deserves to be called son of God because he has no father, no mother. At least Jesus had a mother. I always wonder also how many times in the Bible Christ actually says that I am the son of God. And I also wonder how many prophets in the Bible are called sons of God. And I wonder whether we're all the children of God. So these are things which you, know, you always wonder about when you're discussing these issues. So they say that to the Prophet Muhammad that, okay, we see where you're coming from, but we do not agree. And the Quran mentions this phenomenal moment that occurs. It's the ninth year after Hijrah. You're looking at 23rd, 24th Dhul Hijjah. A year and a bit before the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, dies. So you're talking 21 years into his prophethood. And the Quran at this moment doesn't just tell the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, you challenge them. It asks him to actually tell them that after this knowledge has come to you, you're still disputing me. Say to them, we'll bring our sons, you bring your sons. We'll bring our woman, you bring your woman. We'll bring ourselves, you bring yourselves. We'll enter a mubahala, meaning that we'll ask God to curse those who are wrong from us, the disbelievers. And then, ثُمَّ نَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ The ayah states in Arabic in chapter 3 verse 61. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم فَمَنْ حَاجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَ نَجْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ Whoever disputes with you after the knowledge has been made clear to them. So say to them, we'll bring our sons, you bring yours. We'll bring our woman, you bring your woman. We'll bring ourselves, you bring yourselves. We'll ask God to curse those of us who are wrong. 
who are the disbelievers, if you think I'm a false prophet, remember, you can, you don't just invoke a mubahal at that moment. There's going to be people who are going to spread a rumor that this man's a false prophet. So he's going to have to be willing to look towards his Lord and say, curse me if I'm wrong. And are you willing and that confident to tell the Lord to curse you if you are wrong? And then Allah will withdraw his mercy from the disbelievers. It's huge because the Prophet Muhammad is not saying, okay, you know what, tomorrow I'll debate you. Or tomorrow I'll change your mubahala. He's now brought others into the frame. Talk about bring your sons, will bring ours. Talk about bring your woman, will bring our woman. Talk about bring yourself, I'll bring myself. Who is he going to choose as his sons? Who is he going to take as his woman? And who is he going to look at in the whole of Medinian society? Who he views as being as himself. And it's very interesting that that night, the companions are all wondering which one of us is he going to choose? Because it's a great honor. You know, you're going to be the one revered as either being known as from the sons of Muhammad or of the woman he's married to at the time. You know, the likes of, for example, Um Salama he's married to, Um Habiba he's married to, Aisha he's married to, Zainab he's married to, Hafsa he's married to. You know, he's married to these, you know, renowned women who could easily be... And then as himself, you could choose from 100,000 companions, who is he going to pick as himself? And they're all wondering, and subhanAllah, the next day. The priests are also wondering, is he going to bring his family or his companions? If he brings his companions, we'll enter a mubahala with him. But if he brings his family, we won't. Because a man who's willing to sacrifice his family for the religion, publicly in front of everyone, you know that's a man of God. The next day, who does he take with him as his sons? Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein. Hither to that point, how old are they? Six years of age and five years of age. And it's wonderful how he puts youth at the forefront of the religion. Today in our mosques, there are mosques whose numbers are dwindling. Because the elders are out of touch with the needs of the youth. The dad is more concerned that the sheikh is his friend. Rather than whether his son is inside the majlis or no. London, I'll give you a prime example, London. Four or five of the biggest mosques in London, English lectures are not their main lecture. The sheikh or the sayyid will give a lecture in Arabic. Numbers of youth attending is atrocious. I personally can't blame them. And the organizing committee of the mosques, especially in the Iraqi community in London, will not hand over the keys to the youth. And other communities in London as well. Some have tried to make an effort to say youth should be at the front. But I can guarantee you that in the Wilad of Imam al-Hadi, let's say, last week, I can guarantee you 70% of let's say, for example, Iraqis aged between 20 and 35 did not attend a majlis in one of the prominent mosques in London because the mosque has not put the youth at the forefront. Rasulullah puts Imam al-Hassan, Imam al-Hussein at this very pivotal moment. The Christians have come and said, listen, we'll challenge you. The reputation of the entire religion. The entire religion. His, his own reputation, the Muslim ummah. <laughs> and he puts Imam al-Hassan, Imam al-Hussein when the Quran says, Secondly, it highlights Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein's grand position that if a Muslim today says to me, Hassan and Hussein are great because they're the grandsons of the Prophet Muhammad, I'm like, no. He viewed them as if they were his sons. And that's a huge honor. Muawiyah had a servant by the name of Dhaqwan. And um, he, he was really angry. Why do people say Hassan and Hussein? are the sons of Muhammad. And the Quran mentions to him that in you know, the verse of Mubahala, Abna'ana. And, and so when Eid came, Muawiyah tells the Quran, make sure you give the gifts towards my, towards my uh, sons. What he meant were his grandsons. 
So he said to him, when it comes to your grandsons, it's okay for you to call them sons. But when it comes to Rasulullah, you have a problem with him calling Hassan and Hussein his sons. Mm -hmm. It's a term of endearment. But God has now shown in this verse that this is how high Hassan and Hussein are. And that Imam al Hassan Imam Hussain, alayhi salam, at that young age, at the age of six and five, can represent this religion like Imam al Jawad could. Like Imam al Hujjah could, when people say your Imams were at this young age, this young age. I defy you. Try and defeat our Imams at five or at six or at nine in a debate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He says, فَمَنْ حَاجَكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنْ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ this is a clear statement to everybody that there is none like Hassan and Hussein. Abnana wa abnaakum. Nisa'ana wa nisa'ana. I will bring our woman, you bring your woman. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. He's married to his wives at that time. Yes. There's many great women in Medina at the time. Fantastic woman. He takes Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam with him. Again, to clearly show that none of these come near the Iman or the Taqwa of Fatwa Zahra. And that's why there's no doubt when it says the four women of Jannah are Asiya, Maryam, Khadija, and Fatima alayhi salam. And that she is the greatest of all women. Maryam was the greatest of her time. When Fatima comes, none comes near Fatima. Secondly, what's interesting is that he wants a woman to represent the religion in the public spotlight and politically. How many wonderful sisters in our community were deprived of education, were deprived of representing the religion politically or socially because of the backwardness of our community? That instead of our communities promoting women at the front of the religion, we made a hundred excuses, no, this social hijab. Ninth year after hijrah, a year before he dies, his Lord is telling him, فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَاءَنَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَاءَنَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ And we'll, invite, we'll call upon our woman. The religion of Islam was never meant to be a male chauvinist, arrogant, patriarchal system that did not value the woman in any way. It was meant to be a religion that did not look at the woman and the man except for the value of what they've contributed back to society and their spirituality. Yes, socially there may be different roles at different times and different responsibilities but spiritually the feats to be achieved are the same because I remember when someone said to me Fatima Zahra salam, said that the best hijab is for a uh, you know for the man not to look at the woman woman not to look at the man I said don't take hadiths without looking at other traditions other instances that here in this moment in Mubahala he wants Fatima at the forefront of the religion which should mean in our mosques, women should be making as many decisions as the men in the mosque, should be part of the decisions of the men. I tell you, in my own lecture and career, you find that the women are a lot more religious than the men. The passion for religion, the passion for learning is unique. And yet, subhanAllah, sometimes in our mosques, and I feel sorry, you know, you could say in the West, there's progress being made. I'm not going to say it's going to happen overnight. But there's progress in some parts of Middle East, the Indo-Pak subcontinent, Africa, the way women are looked at is more barbaric treatment, honestly. And yet here you have the greatest woman with her father wanting her at the forefront of the religion. Represent us. Our woman should be the best when it comes to representing. We shouldn't be hiding them. Should be proud when they write books, proud when they give lectures, proud when they teach, proud when they have the best of careers in law or medicine or finance or other areas. So you've got Hassan and Hussein, Fatima Zahra. And how old was Fatima Zahra on that day? 16? That's amazing again. 
people forget that Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Imam Hassan al Hussein, young family at the forefront of the religion. So we've got Imam Hassan al Hussein, Abna'ana wa Abna'akum. Nisa'ana wa Nisa'akum, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. Then there's a final line which Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas reminds Muawiyah about in Sahih Muslim. My dear brothers and sisters, in the chapter in Sahih Muslim on the virtues of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And I beg you, let's become a community of readers. I'm begging people. In the chapter of the virtues of Imam Ali, Muawiyah, son of Abu Sufyan, asks Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, what prevents you from cursing Ali, son of Abu Talib? Now this, this, you know, wallah, this baffles me when I read this tradition because why Muawiyah and Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, who people will say, you know, may Allah be pleased with them next to their names. Why have we reached a stage at Muawiyah's time where we're asking questions about what prevents a companion supposedly going to Jannah from cursing Ali? <laughs> I remember Nawawi in his explanation of this tradition says, yes, what Muawiyah meant is, what is it that prevents you from cursing Ali? Is it your taqwa? Sa'ad ibn Waqas replies by saying that there are certain attributes given to Ali ibn Abi Talib, certain, you know, certain merits that he has. And he mentions on the day of Mubahala, he was known as the self of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Sahih Muslim. I ask everybody. And Tafsir al Jalalain of Suyuti and Mahalli. Tafsir al Jalalain. In Sahih Muslim, it's clear. Muawiyah asked Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, what prevents you from cursing Ali? Which goes to show you the idea of fourth Khalifa, rightly guided, was not early. Nonsense. <coughs> Comes later in, in Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah's creed of four rightly guided caliphs. And Sa'ad mentions, he mentions Khaybar, for example, but he also mentions Mubahala. He mentions that day where the companions are all yearning. Who, what? Better accolade on this, in this life is there to achieve than being known as the nafs of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Because if we were to say, all the prophets are great, but the greatest is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Then what about the person who's known as the nafs of Muhammad? What position does that put him? Imam Ali ibn Talib alayhi how old was he on that day? 31. In his youth. And they all now go towards the Christians. And the Christians are mesmerized by looking at Ashab al Kisa all together. In the same way that they were together in the revelation of 3333 from the word Innama. Now they're mesmerized, looking at the light shining from their faces. Muhammad, Ali, Fatima, Hassan, and Hussein. And the description is so vivid. And you wonder, which religion would be proud of a generation that massacred the family of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon family? With the last of them lying on the ground 50 years after this incident in Karbala. And so what takes place is that the Christians see this. When they see this, they say, we're not going to enter a Mubahana. Why? Because the amount of light that shines from those five faces, if it told a mountain to move, the mountain would move. <laughs> Subhanallah. And that's why every Muslim on this earth has to love Al Muhammad. I'm not obligated to love every companion, but I'm obligated to love Al Muhammad. If I mention Al Muhammad in my salah, it's not void. If I mention the name of a companion in my salah, and my tashahud, it becomes void. Al Muhammad, we always say, Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala alihi. Same way God chose the family of Abraham with the covenant of prophethood. No one called that a monarchy. When God chose Al Muhammad, they said, You Shia only follow like a monarchy, son, 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 son. With Ibrahim, it was all cool. Ibrahim, Ishaq, Dawood, Yaqub, and so on. But now with Al-Muhammad, you have some sort of hasad. 
You have some envy of what God gave Al Muhammad? And so subhanallah, he made it clear. Because people always say, Ghadir, is that the only time he showed Imam Ali's greatness? At Mubahala, Sa'ad says, I remember that day where he said Ali is his self. Yeah. At the moment, I'm in a mind-blown state of mind. I think we need to go to a break so Inshallah. I can digest <laughs> God bless. the story and the amazing knowledge you have, mashallah. Uh, so to our dear viewers, uh, please join us after a short break. We'll be back. Uh, I don't know where to begin with the questions I have for Sayyid Ammar, but inshallah in the second part of the show, I'll put some questions forward to him. Uh, you've sent some questions via WhatsApp. Uh, you can also ring in live to the channel. Uh, the number is 0203-515-0199. We look forward to joining you after the break, inshallah, looking deeper into the event of Mubahala, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to part two of Live in London with our esteemed guest, Dr. Said Amman Nakshwani. Tonight's topic is the topic of the event of Mubahila. Now, if you missed part one, especially the end of part one, you've missed out on a great, great story told by the Sayyid. I'm still trying to get my head around what actually happened. Um, and coming back to the event of Mubahila, why, if the Prophet came as a Prophet of mercy, why would he then challenge people to curse them? Shouldn't he have yeah, just well, prayed for them? It or? Certainly, it's not like the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, to go around looking to curse people or to wish upon them to become pigs and monkeys <laughs> and so on, which I think certain scholars allude to that had they accepted this mubahala, this is what you know may have been a punishment. And you know, scholars differ upon this. I think. There is there's a recognition here that these people are part of a community who believe in him as a who believe that he is a false prophet, people who believe that he is the antichrist. If you're going to be spreading rumors like that, then are you willing to enter this curse? And and it's interesting that some of the Christian priests are narrated to have turned around and said, "Listen, let's not enter the curse now. If you know if God wants to, by the end of the year, he's going to destroy this guy anyway. You know, and uh, and they look at the terms." And they're thinking, well, you know what? If the Jews are going to be subordinate to the authority of um, Muhammad and agree to pay a tax um, for the state, maybe that's the best terms which we could go with. Inshallah. We've just had a caller phone in. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, uh, brother, could you share yes. your name and your question, please? Assalamu uh, alaikum viewers, my name is Brother Hamid from New Jersey. Uh, how are you, Sayyid Jabir and Sayyid Amar? Wa alaikum assalam, brother. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I just had a question, and this is a question I've had for a very long time now. Alhamdulillah, I just found the answer to it. So, inshallah, I would uh, like to ask a question as to why did it take so long for this answer to be, uh, for this question to be answered for me, uh, inshallah. One of the, we all know that the Quran has many different layers. For example, a mathematical layer that many people use in debates, be it with Christians uh, or non-believers, uh, about the Quran as, as a miracle of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, is the of the many numerical miracles in the Quran. For example, if you take a look at the number of times the word al, which is land, and the sea is mentioned, you see you get the exact ratio that Earth is seventy percent uh, water and 30% land. Or, for example, in the as it's Mubahala, the, the Quran, as you mentioned in the verse, it says 25 times, uh, it says the, the comparison of Adam salam, is the comparison of Jesus, peace be upon them both. The name Muhammad وسلم, is mentioned four times in the Quran, correct? Yes. And the Quran, in that same, in the next verse, it says, and and we just discussed how um, it refers to Amir Mu'mani Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, correct? Yes. Yes. How come, uh, you 
you know, four times Muhammad is mentioned, it, sh- it should make sense that four times Ali is mentioned as well in the Quran as well, no? Well, my dear brother, we found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not through our eyes, but through our intellect. We really don't need for us to have four and four or 72 and 28 or 50 and 50 or all these different ratios mathematically for me to believe in God. I found Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the creation of God. I recognize that for every creation there must be a first cause, the creator and so on. And likewise I recognize that my Lord would not be unjust in leaving us without guidance and he sent prophets of God and it's inconceivable that the final of those prophets would leave the world without announcing a successor who would guide the people socially, spiritually and politically. And so did I really need to find that Ali has to be mentioned four times because Muhammad is mentioned four times. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has already mentioned numerous examples of his closeness with Imam Ali alayhi salam without there being a need for a particular equation for it. Yes. If I see the Prophet peace be upon his family saying Ali is to me like Aaron was to Moses, that suffices for me. If I see the Prophet calling him his nafs, that suffices for me. If I see the Holy Prophet peace be upon his family saying only Allah and Ali know me and only me and Ali know Allah and only Allah and me know Ali, that suffices for me. And even without all of this, had I not been a Muslim, I would be enamored by the wonderful relationship of Rasulullah and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam. A 30 year age gap. But the wonderful foresight and vision of these two greatest creations of God. So, while some may look for these types of equations and miracles, I think intellectually we could see, as well as through literature, the greatness of the two. Yes, I Going back to the topic of why the Prophet would invoke them in a curse, um, if we were to look at the concept of cursing within Islam, I know it's mentioned in the Quran, is, is it a concept in, in Islam? Well, in the Quran, you know, as, as in you're saying cursing, I think, well, you know, the word cursing in Arabic, you're looking at the word seb, for example. And you look in the Quran in chapter 6 verse 108, you see the Quran saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa la tasubbu al-lazina yad'una min dun Allah fa yasubbu Allah adwan bi ghayri ilm Do not curse the idols of the idol worshippers for they'll turn around and curse your Lord. Sab. La'in is not cursing. La'in is a supplication where you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to withdraw his mercy from an individual or from a group of people. So we saw that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ Sometimes prophets of Allah are the ones who do la'na. لُعْنَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ عَلَى لِسَانِ دَاوُودُ وَعِيسَ بْنِ مَرْيَمِ That the disbelievers from the children of Israel, you'll find, that they were supplicated against by Prophet David and the Prophet Jesus We are also expected to be of those who at times supplicate to Allah to withdraw His mercy from the oppressors. If you look in the Quran in chapter 2 verse 159 And the ones who are saying what we have given from the signs and the signs and the signs after what we have given to the people in the book أُولَٰئِكَ يَلْعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَلْعَنَهُمُ اللَّاعِنُونَ اللَّاعِنُونَ therefore are a group of people who ask Allah to withdraw His mercy from individuals. The Holy Prophet Muhammad peace be upon his family said لَعْنَ O oh Allah withdraw your mercy from those who do not go with Usama on the army. From those who turn back from the army of Usama when the Holy Prophet peace be upon his family was about to pass away he had ordered the companions to go under Usama bin Zayd the 18 year old and some of them rejected this and he said Lana on those who turn away from the army of Usama. Lana therefore is a Quranic concept. To ask Allah to withdraw his mercy is there. But there's certain things we need to understand with any concept especially in the world of Tabarra. Number one there's a time and place. If I'm gonna ask Allah to withdraw his mercy from an individual, if I'm sitting next to someone who reveres that individual, I'm not gonna do Lana then 
and that person's feelings may be affected and harmed and it's not the best of etiquettes. If I want to do a lana on an individual, between me and my Lord, I can recite that lana. You see, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, Imam al-Sadiq, when they teach us Ziyarat Ashura, there's certain lanas which are there without any names. There's a precedent that's set. Also, we have to remember, make sure the lana doesn't rebound on you. Because if I'm going to do lana, I'm going to ask Allah, Ya Allah, Allahumma lana, for example, Shimr bin Dil Joshan. Why? Because Shimr bin Dil Joshan, let's say, did not want the woman to be wearing their hijab. If I'm the type of person who's saying, I don't want to marry a girl who wears hijab, or I don't want my daughter to wear hijab, then why am I doing lana on Shimr against the ladies of Karbala when I might be that person at home? I do la'na, for example, Allahumma al'an Yazid, son of Muawiyah. Why? Because Yazid, son of Muawiyah, is a person who had musicians all around him in his palace in Sham. If I'm the type of person who can't live but listen to music, and listen to music of a nature which is vulgar, or music of a nature which is against the teachings of Al Muhammad, so why am I doing la'na on Yazid if I'm doing the same? Or if, for example, I'm doing la'na on someone like Ibn Ziyad, because, let's say, Ibn Ziyad was someone who had spread rumors about people of the household of Rasulullah in the community and lied. If I'm someone who's gossiping and lying about people's lives, then why am I doing la'na on Ibn Ziyad? So while la'na is, is seen in this eye of mubahala, that you, you, know, you ask Allah to withdraw his mercy from individuals, we have to make sure it doesn't rebound back on us. So after the, you mentioned the Prophet, Hazrat Zahra salam alayha, Imam Ali alayhi salam, Imam Hassan, Imam Hussain came together, the priests saw them, saw the light in their faces and said, if these guys were to tell a mountain to move, the mountain would move. <laughs> we don't want to have any trouble sure. with them. What happened after that? Did the priests just pack up and go home? Did they convert? Did they go back to Najran? No, then it was agreed that, you know, uh, you're more than welcome to continue worshipping in your churches. You don't, you we're not going to force you with a sword to become Muslim. If a person is forced to become Muslim with that sword, this is null and void. And this is a disgrace to the religion of Islam. Whenever you see a person walking around the Islamic State with a sword in their hands, brandishing it to anyone who disagrees with them, then you know there's issues, sadly. And so what you find is that they say to them, listen, continue worshipping in your churches. That's the world view of Muhammad and Al Muhammad. And let's be clear, there's not many others who had that world view, unless there was a political maneuver he was looking to pull at one point or another. And, and so with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, he says to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, write the treaty. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, in my opinion, politically is hardly ever mentioned with reverence the way he deserves. You've got some orientalists and some academics who try and say Ali ibn Abi Talib politically is inept. Because when he becomes a uh, caliph of the Islamic State, there are civil wars and so on. I'll never forget that person who said to him, how comes in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, we had no wars, well, when you become Khalifa, we have three. And he says, because in their time, they dealt with people like me, whereas in my time, I have to deal with people like you. <laughs> and so I think with Imam Ali ibn Tabi also mentions, if it wasn't for taqwa, I would be the most cunning of Arabs. But I'm conscious of Allah and all my decisions that I make. And number three, those who say Ali ibn Abi Talib, spiritually he's my leader, but politically I take others. Who wrote the Treaty of Hudaybiyah? Who wrote the Treaty of Najran? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib And in terms of the treaty, it was a certain amount of generosity and donations were to be given in a couple of months of the year back towards the poor. Certain amount of tax that was to be levied on them. What we refer to as the jizya for the non-Muslim who lives within the Islamic State. And from then they were able to go back and worship as any person should be allowed to be worshipped. Place of worship may not be mine, but if the people are there, people of peace, then why shouldn't they not be allowed to worship what they theologically have concluded for their life? So carrying on on the topic of Imam Ali alayhi salam, a message is coming from uh, Sister Zahra Ali in London. She says, Imam Ali is a man of unity. 
What advice would you give to bring about unity and peace between people in conflict? Either two friends or two family members, rather than well, a you know, it's initiated it's Such a question, we have to be a bit more precise. Where unity, what are we referring to? Are we referring to unity within the household, unity within the community, unity between members of the religion? If you're talking on a, let's say, if you're talking, for example, on the communal level, look at the word com, unity. There's no way we're going to flourish, whether we're in London or in America or wherever we are, unless the members of our community are willing to let bygones be bygones and build and work together again. Till today, we have factions in our community. This mosque follows that marja. This mosque follows that marja. This group loves this marja. This group hates that marja. And this has to be removed. This is a disease in our community and we have to make sure that it's out quickly. I don't want it to spread anymore. And I know there are people who are working actively to try and bring unity between the mosques in our community. If it's within our own madhab, we certainly need that. Because I hear many people talk about Shia Sunni unity. First, let's have Shia Shia unity. And if it's there then on Shia Sunni unity, here in the UK, I think more and more initiatives have to be made where we bring the leaders of our communities together and discuss the many areas where there are common denominators. I'm not going to deny. In my theology, I'm Shia. In my identity, I'm certainly Shia. And my conclusions, I may differ with other schools in Islam, but that shouldn't stop me. That on the day of Eid or the day of honoring the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family, or the day of honoring uh, the Quran and its role in our life, or on the day of breaking iftar, the Muslims have to come together. So there are many different levels in our lives in which we are able to bring uh, unity in our different relationships. So let's put unity amongst Muslims aside for a second. We live in a majority Christian country, being in the United Kingdom. How can we use the event of Mubahila to our advantage as Muslims? Because as you mentioned rightly, it's mentioned both in Shia authentic books and Sunni authentic books. So how can we do justice for this Eid and involve the Christians around us? Maybe we can tell them. What would your advice be to someone who wants to connect with the greater Christian community, for example? Well, I'd love if there was an exhibition that was done where people were able to see how the Qur'an looks at Christian theology, Christian narrative, uh, Christian scripture. And by bringing together in this exhibition sections on, for example, Surat al-Buruj, Surat al-Kahf, Surat Yaseen, Surat Maryam, these surahs of the Holy Qur'an, these chapters, Surat al-Buruj is, of course, chapter 85. And Surat al-Kahf is chapter 18. Surat Yasin, chapter 36. Surat Maryam, chapter 19. Bringing these chapters where there is the mention of Christ, the mention of Mary, in the Quran. Because we live in a Europe today where, believe you me, there are far-right groups who want to try and show that the religions are so far away from one another. And sadly, a certain movement within Islam and within Christianity which has taken us to extremes where people don't want to sit, talk or break bread. But Alhamdulillah, you have for example the Pope recently setting a precedent talking about the Rohingya and the oppression there. And that is a huge step. And I myself, for example, have spoken out for example, for the people who are the Copts of Egypt who have, in some cases, been treated barbarically in the last 40 years, let alone the history before that. Instead of people remembering the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, being married to a cop from Egypt, by the name of Maria al qubtiya we have that tension. So the leaders have to come together. There has to be scriptural reasoning. There has to be exhibitions that are done. Where people are able to come and see what are the different markers in our history. And appreciate there were negatives, but appreciate that there were positives and that we can build on those positives. The Quran says, Allah. 
Say, O people of the book, come to a joint word between us and you. We'll worship no one but God. We won't take partners to God. All law give us besides God. And I think that ethos is what we have to try and instill in what is a very diff difficult period. I don't think the far right of Christianity was as outspoken as it is today, was as vicious as it is today. And I'm saddened when I see the Islamic extreme, which is so visible in the media. But when you're looking at Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and you're looking at the Pope, and they see a situation where Muslims are under oppression, they both speak out. Those are the type of role models who remind me of the Najashi of Abyssinia and the help he offered the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family when Islam was at its birth. So hopefully those are people and examples which we can adopt in our lives. You've got countries, for example, such as Lebanon, where Muslims and Christians live together, but sadly, in some cases, there are so many misconceptions about each other's beliefs that need to be addressed so that our kids can live by understanding and appreciating our common denominators. There are many who are neighbors there, but deep down there's still a friction there. And there shouldn't be. But sometimes a person wonders, is it true you Muslims do this? Is it true you Muslims do that? And, and, and it's only through dialogue that we're going to be able to show that, listen, Moses, Jacob, Abraham, David, the love of God, all of these are part and parcel of our lives. And hopefully that type of dialogue will build for a healthier future for human beings. I remember in my hometown in Iran, northwest Iran, Urumiya, there's a uh, church back from the Roman times, if I'm not mistaken, still there now. Uh, roof's fallen down a little bit, but every year there's a lot of Christians living in that town. When it becomes to Muharram, they come out into the streets, they do let me out with us, they provide food for the Muslims, and it's a great time to get them involved in our majalis and also teach them about our religion and learn from them as well. Uh, a question's come in from uh, Brother Amin going on the topic of people. He says, uh, I have a question about using the verse of Al Mubahila. Can people use it between each other when they debate on issues concerning faith nowadays, uh, either by normal people or scholars? I've seen on Facebook myself two guys get at it. One of them says, I invoke this on you, the other one, I invoke that on you. Is, is there conditions to this thing, or is it just a. Well, uh, you know, I, I would hope that we leave this as a prophetic issue uh, rather than some randoms who want to start invoking curses upon one another. <laughs> And I think that you look at Ayatollah Sistani, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lengthen his life. And his message is clear that you know what? Try amongst yourselves to give the best image of Ahl al Bayt. Don't be of those who are throwing around curses everywhere or of those who are invoking curses uh, you know, onto people. Try your hardest to have the best akhlaq and let the people see the Ahl al Bayt through your manners, through your actions. So I would say that these are to be left for those who are chosen by Allah rather than those who think they are chosen by Allah. The keyboard warriors on Facebook. Sure. <laughs> uh, another brilliant question come in. It says, some of our Sunni brothers give an argument that before the revelation of Mubahila verse, the verse already revealed about the wives of the Prophet, they shouldn't leave their house. Uh, that's why they say at Mubahil the Prophet didn't bring his wives. What would we respond to? Well, if the verse was uh, absolute about the wives not leaving their house, how does Aisha leave on the day of the camel? If the verse says, as it says in chapter 33, verse 33, <laughs> Now, if the verse is saying this, and they're saying that therefore, Fatima going on Mubahalas because the wives couldn't leave. How does Aisha, the wife of the Prophet, come out in the battle of Basra, the battle of Jamal, and fight Imam Ali alayhi salam? But I suppose for the feminists out there, they, um, they use her as a good response for, for those who say that uh, women have no rights in Islam. Um, you know, uh, they will say that no, women do have rights. Aisha, wife of the Prophet, fought Ali ibn Abi Talib. It's a clear symbol of rights in Islam. Uh, another question from Brother Ihsan in London. 
He says, uh, what are the key differences between understanding Rasulullah through Imam Ali alayhi salam compared to other schools and groups and how important is it to continue the characterization of Rasulullah through the Ahlul Bayt for the world to truly know our Prophet is and the Islam he brought about? It's, it's, it's a great point. I, I, you know, the seer of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, can either be taken from Anas, bin Malik, or Aisha, or Abu Huraira, or it could be taken from the Ahlul Bayt, and I know which one I'll choose. And I'm confident about the ones that I'll choose. And um, yeah, I, I really don't need Anas or Abu Huraira or, or Aisha to be the ones who tell me about the biography of my Prophet. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, his grandsons, the likes of Imam al Baqir, Imam al Sadiq, I'll take lessons of the Prophet's life any day from them. Of course, someone might argue, well, you will narrate this tradition if she narrates it about, for example, Ahl al Kisa. I don't mind, as long as there's no contradiction with Imam al Baqir, Imam al Sadiq, I'll take it any day. But it's a shame, you know, if you look at the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, made by those outside of Ahl al Bayt, I'm not surprised Rushdie wrote the Satanic verses. At the beginning of the show, we, well, I mentioned Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Ghadir, and we mentioned Eid al-Mubahila isn't celebrated amongst us in the ways the other Eids are, for example, Eid al-Adha as well. What should we do to celebrate this event? Because just to Go say, out and chill and enjoy <laughs> and, you know, have a good time. You know, I, I do believe our mosques are quite stale sometimes. Um, in the sense of, you know, you go there and sometimes it's just a lecture and someone recites some poetry, give a bit of food if you're lucky that night. Um, always makes for a great attendance. <laughs> and then after that, you, you know, you, you socialize. And I do believe sometimes changing it up a bit. Um, may Allah bless the brothers at the Haidar Islamic Center who I had the honor of, you know, serving for many years, who always made it a point to try and change up sometimes the birth, do the odd quiz, the odd raffle, you know, do the odd question and answer session, uh, give out prizes, you know, maybe hire a place for a fair, you know, for the kids to enjoy. And, you know, don't just stick to the same pattern. Maulana gives a lecture and then after that, you know, people socialize some food and so on. I believe that, you know, we can, we can make our, our celebrations true Eids in the way that we want. You see, some Muslims, when it comes to weddings, they go absolutely wild. Um, now, I'm not saying go that wild, but I certainly believe that we should make our occasions, you know, these celebrations, joyous ones. And if in your local area or your community people aren't doing it, then do it at home. Invite people home. Don't make an excuse, well, there's nothing in the mosque, so I'm not going to do anything. Ahl al-Bayt, tell us, Rahimallahu man ahya amrana. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, shower his mercy on those who revive our affairs. And it should be a, an honor uh, that we revive the affairs of Al Muhammad in our mosques, but also in our houses in a way which is suitable, which doesn't go outside the boundaries of the principles set by Ahlul Bayt, but certainly bring more joy to the occasion, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, another question from b Brother Ali Haider from Greenford. He says, uh, Salam is Mubahila just for Muslims or is it against people from different faiths? Has it ever occurred? within Islam, so for example, a Muslim against a Muslim in the history of Islam? I, history of the religion, you know, seeing other, you know, um, examples which are narrated authentically. I can't vouch that I've seen something narrated authentically. There's a couple of mentions, but pre-Islamic Arabia, it's certainly mentioned that there were Mubahilas taking place and that the Arabs knew of it and they knew. And you could see it in their poetry as well, the mentioning. Uh, a question via Facebook from uh, Pasha Zahra. She says, Salam, I have been listening to people's comments about music, uh, that everything in the world has its own tune, even when water or rain falls uh, down on anything. Music is in everything and it's not haram. Could you please explain a little bit more uh, regarding this? Well, you know, I don't want to be one of those who's, you know, completely puts a blanket and says music is completely haram. I think, uh, I think like, you know, a knife, uh, it could kill a human being or it could cut an orange for you. And I think there's positives and negatives. I think that there are some positives which can be used in our communities, you know, in the world of film, the world of media. Who, who can reject the fact that you, the odd drum was used 
to rally the troops in the early days of the religion of Islam. And even with some instruments, I don't want to put a blanket that every instrument is bad because I've read the works and the discussions of our grand scholars that you, there may be certain instruments that could be used in a positive way. I just think that the bottom line when it comes to music is if you believe that what you're listening to would represent the Ahlul Bayt and the teachings of the Quran, then go ahead. But if you could see that it's the opposite of the teachings of the other in the Quran, there are no two hearts in one body. You have to make up your mind where your heart is. Many times people ask the question, I wonder where would I have been on the 10th of Muharram? Would I have been on Yazid's army? Or would I have been with Imam Hussein's army? And I think sometimes it's just think, small things like this which tell you that, you know, in Karbala, as the famous scholar said, knowledge lies on the ground in Karbala while silk and musicians sit on the throne of Damascus. And I think a person has to begin to reflect at what stage of their life do they want to make that move towards um, you know, the following of Ahl al-Bayt in all their teachings and not following maybe in Muharram or just in the holy month of Ramadan. But for a person to put a blanket outright ban and say, you know what, any music is haram, no. There are positives and negatives. And I think any human being out there who's even nothing to do with the religion of Islam will say to you that there's some music which is vulgar, the language is the language of people who are corrupt or people who are immoral. And there's other types of music which on the contrary is far away from that world, maybe pleasant to listen to, the classical type may be soothing for some. And then, you know, after that everyone refers uh, to their conscience and the talk that it gives them. Okay. Uh, staying on the topic of language and corrupt language, a uh, message from Brother Ali from Sweden. He says, uh, why do we have to be diplomatic in our tabarra when we are just telling the truth? Could you shed some more light on that? Well, I think my imams are the ones who, you know, when they leave me a ziyara like ziyarat Ashura, they're, they're being pretty... Um, they're, they're giving the truth, but they're also highlighting that not everybody, not all the truth has to be mentioned all the time. And, um, you know, suffice for us to say that the ethos of the Qur'an is invite to the way of your Lord. Invite towards the way of your Lord with wisdom, which 99% of us lack, and a kind word. And speak to them in a way which is better. And this is something we have to adopt in our lives. And the Ahlul Bayt telling us, Kunu lana zaynan, wa la takunu alayna shaynan. We have to be a source of adornment for the message of Al Muhammad. <coughs> Tabarra is not just in Lahna and things like that. You could write a book which talks about the oppression against Al Muhammad. You could write a book which talks about what's happened to the followers of Ahlul Bayt when they try to hold on to the message of Al Muhammad. It doesn't always have to be a, you know, a fierce battle. I'm better than you, I'm greater than you. There are different ways in which a person is able to dissociate, which is the original meaning of the word tabarra. And I guarantee you, a lot of people who talk about tabarra don't even know where it is in the Quran. And that's where our prime problem is. Half the people who want to do these things don't even know any verse. Or when they bring verses of the Holy Quran, they'll bring you verses to suit their argument. A person has to build a relationship with the Qur'an, with the Ahlul Bayt and invite people towards the way of God in a manner of wisdom, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, a question, you mentioned the event of Mubahila was narrated um, as, as a sort of one example from the servant of Muawiyah. Is it narrated anywhere within Christian books? Uh, no, I, I've not come across it in Christian literature. I've certainly seen, you know, certain Orientalists who've discussed it and they've they put their question marks on the event as to whether it actually took place. Was it a forgery of a dialogue just to show that Muslims and Christians had, had met and had discussed their religions? But in Sunni literature, as I said, Muawiyah's conversation with Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas, where Sa'ad refers to the nafs title given to Imam Ali on the day of Mubahala, and Tafsir al-Jalalain of Suyuti and Mahalli, where it's clearly mentioned that the Prophet took Imam Ali, Imam Hassan, Imam al Hussein, and Fatima al Zahra on that day. Inshallah. Yeah. Uh, another final question, uh, just to end the show, inshallah. It says, uh, What is the best du'a that we can read if we feel our hearts and souls are dead from the trials of the world? 
any so, recommendations? So many wonderful supplications of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Um, and you know, many times a person may feel down in this world, it may be difficult. Imam Ali ibn Talib says a wonderful line which we should take from him. Do not say, Ya Allah, don't test me. You will be tested. Rather say, Ya Allah, don't test me with that which shakes my faith in you. Mm -hmm. And while your faith in Allah is still strong, then that test is not that bad. Um, but I would recommend, you know, of the beautiful du'as for such a thing, why not recite du'a yastashiyah? and see uh, how much of an effect it has on you, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, another great episode, another great night. I myself have learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time, Sayyidina. Uh, oh, Eid al-Mubahila. Yeah. Mubarak you. to you in, you. in advance. Uh, and to our respected viewers at home, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Live in London with our esteemed guest, Dr. Sayyidina Manak Shwani. Uh, we will be back, inshallah, soon with another topic. Uh, looking to see you. Please keep us in your prayers. Uh, and a pre-Eid Mubarak for the Eid of Mubahala, inshallah, to you and your families. And do keep us in your du'as. Uh, as always, uh, I'm sorry if I couldn't get to all of your questions via WhatsApp, Facebook. Um, but you could call in, inshallah, in the near future and speak to us directly. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.